speaker, we would like to welcome Anna Pozzoli. She's a physical therapist and certified lymphedema therapist. She is the CEO and co-founder of Omnitherapy Clinic in New Jersey. She's a lymphedema and lymphedema specialist. She's a graduate from Polytechnical Institute of Anschied Holland owner of Omnitherapy with spouse and co-founder Oscar Pozzoli in clinic in New Jersey. 30 years licensed physical therapist, 25 years as a certified clinical educator and specialty in orthopedics lymphedema. So she's she has lots of clients in New Jersey and it's our opportunity for us to have her today to discuss more about her cases and she was going to discuss what is lipidema. Last workshop, she discussed the pathophysio and the nice wrapping and bandaging of the lymphedema. And today, she will going to explain what is lipidema and the simplified explanation of that. So without further ado, I have Anna Pozzoli. Thank you so much, Anna. Hi, Hi, good evening uh, to everybody here, or good afternoon in the United States. Good morning in the Philippines. I understand that we also have an audience out there. Um, thank you for joining us again, and thank you, Dr. Jen, for making this possible and sharing the knowledge. Um, it is an honor to um, provide information and uh, also get more people to understand the difference of what lymphedema and lipedema is. Um, you know, a lot of our, my colleagues today will be presenting on what uh, lymphedema is all about. And I feel the need to represent my population of females that have lipedema. So I have a PowerPoint presentation that I would like to share, if that's possible. Here we go. Um, hold on one second. Can you see me there? Can you see the PowerPoint? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, hold on. All right. All right. One second. I'll get this. Here we go, hold on one second. Uh, all right, so now we go back to here. Okay. Sorry, give me one second, Jenny. Very good. Thank you. Um, uh, hold on. Okay. And, okay. Uh, minimize it. I have some technical difficulties here. Hold on one second. I apologize to everybody. Um, give me one second, Jenny. Uh, You're okay, Miss Anna. Take your time. Here we go. How about there? Mm -hmm. Nothing? Yeah. Okay. Nothing yet. Mm -hmm. So on the screen share, right? And then you just, and then try to be sure you click the small box there, that video or. Mm -hmm. Just like before I screen share. Yeah. Right yeah. here. Mm -hmm. Here we go. I think we're. 
about yeah. now. Uh -huh. yeah, you know. All oh, right. Okay. Very good. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we go to. Yes. One second. Beautiful. No, not into. Slideshow. Here we go. We're going to go right from the beginning. Hi, I'm sorry, guys. Um, physical therapy and lymphedema is my forte, not, not uh, technical stuff. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining on this Lymphedema Awareness. Lymphedema Awareness Month uh, is March 2022nd, and the 6th, of course, we celebrate the day to spread this awareness. Um, and again, Thank you, Dr. Jenny, for allowing me this opportunity to be able to share my information. So today I will talk about um, lipedema and some of the management um, that goes along. So the title of my presentation is Lipedema Management Simplified. My name is Anna Pozzolis. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a physical therapist, certified lymphedema therapist, and I practice in New Jersey and Bloomfield, New Jersey, along with my husband and one other new colleague that we have on stuff, Nellie Bloom. And um, so we have been doing this for over 25 years in, in Bloomfield, New Jersey. And the more and more I grow, the more I want to share with everybody else. Um, I have nothing to disclose, um, just that I am the owner, co-owner with Oscar of Omni Therapy Center. Okay, so what is lipedema? Um, a lot of times uh, things get confused in the lymphatic world, and I want to uh, be able to share this knowledge with everybody else. Um, so lipedema is a disease of fibrotic loose connective tissue, predominantly is known to be in females, uh, where they have increased nodular and fibrotic adipose tissue that is deposited under the skin. It also has been termed a painful fat syndrome. Uh, and this usually can occur at a time of hormonal changes. So what I mean by that is um, when a 15 year old, 13 year old uh, reaches puberty, their hormonal changes, the body can start to change at this level. Um, also during childbirth years, that's another hormonal event that this can start to uh, kind of manifest itself. I've also have seen it with women in premenopause as well as menopausal age. So there's really uh, a lot more information out there about how all this is uh, translating into the genetic aspect of it, but we, we are working on it uh, very hard to get a better definition, but these are some of the things that we do see. Uh, it can be related to weight changes and shape changes. That's the, the first thing that uh, women will start to notice. Some of these changing uh, occurring in their bodies, whether it's their weight or how their legs or even arms can uh, change. Uh, there may be a history in the family of someone having this type of leg. And it's, most of the time it's on the females. Uh, and it doesn't mean that it has to be on the maternal side. It can also be on the grandmother on the father's side as well, okay? Uh, the early recognition of lipedema, it actually goes back to the 1940s when uh, American physicians, Dr. Allen and Dr. Hines were the first one to describe uh, an abnormal deposit of fat tissue affecting females. Hardly ever did they find it in males, only if there are some hormonal issues going on. Uh, lipedema was given the name at the Mayo Clinic, believe it or not, back in the 1940s. Uh, what is the prevalence of lipedema? It, uh, lipedema is often misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed by many doctors nowadays, although it goes back to 1940 that it had been recognized uh, in today's world, I still find a lot of doctors that are not uh, aware what this is or confuse it with uh, another lymphatic disorder. Uh, it has been estimated that uh, to affect about 11% and possibly up to 39% of the female population, with 11% uh, being the lowest prevalence, it, that equates to about 16 million women in the US. Um, 
Now, how does this differ from lymphedema? Lymphedema is a disorder of the lymphatic system, which is part of your immune system. Uh, that will bring about swelling of an extremity or a body part, not necessarily on both legs or both arms, but it can be on one uh, extremity or even facial edema, uh, depending on what the cause of the lymphatic issue is. And that is buildup of lymphatic fluid in the soft tissue. Uh, it can be due to damaged or blocked lymphatic system from surgeries. Uh, you could be born with a primary lymphedema as well, uh, obesity, uh, inactivity. All those things can contribute to lymphedema. Here I have um, put, I don't know, can everybody see this or do we need to move the the sidebar, I, you guys let me know. Um, but here, I've what I've done is I've put a chart for comparison because many times lipedema is not only confused with lymphedema, but it can also be confused with obesity. And a lot of times, unfortunately, the patients that I see, they've all been told you're just obese because of your BMI, meaning the uh, body mass index, it's elevated. But in reality, they're not looking at all the components that you, you have to take into consideration if you're looking at someone with lipedema. And uh, just to kind of briefly go over it, it's, uh, is it unilateral? Is it only in one side? In lipedema, it's not. In lymphedema, yes, it is. Obesity, never. Um, is it bilateral? Always in obesity and lipedema, but not always in lymphedema. Um, the main thing that uh, it points apart is the feet. Are the feet affected by swelling? And in obesity, not normally, but neither is it in lymphedema, in lipedema. Uh, but usually in lymphedema, you do see it. Um, uh, again, can it start in childhood years? Not necessarily, but it may be obvious when you get to puberty, okay? Tenderness, yes. There is a lot of tenderness. It could be moderate to severe. Bruising is also moderate to severe in a lipedema patient. Uh, a stemmer sign, which is uh, being able to pinch in between the second toe, uh, that's usually negative in lipedema, just like it is in obesity. But in lymphedema, you would see a positive stemmer sign. Um, the consistency of the skin, usually in obesity, it would be normal. Uh, normal in lipedema to very soft where in lymphedema, it's thicker and firmer, and a lot of times there is fibrosis related to it. Um, with the main thing with lipedema is the pain, the inflammatory factor that it undertakes. You don't see that with obesity, and in lymphedema, it can be uncomfortable just from the swelling that's occurring. And you can see uh, my little pictures here. Uh, with obesity, if you uh, go on a diet, you can reduce. But with lipedema, that is a lot more challenging. Here you can see lipedema legs with easily bruising. And this is a lymphatic um, patient where they only have the swelling on the one side. Uh, now, this just gives you a little bit of a better uh, depiction of lymphatic disorders. Uh, these three pictures up here are the different stages of lymphedema. Uh, in the stage one, well, there's a stage zero, which is subclinical, and that can only be picked up by bioimpedance. Um, but in stage one, you see a little bit of uh, swelling, thickening. It starts to get worse and more fibrotic. And then in the um, a third stage, which uh, is considered elephantiasis, you see a marked difference, and the texture of the skin is very different. Now, down here, we have the different stages of lipedema, which is the, uh, in stage one, uh, normal skin texture. Uh, in the second stage, you start to get some granular um, deposits in the thigh area, and they start to become a bit uncomfortable. In the third stage, you start to also get more granular deposits. In addition to that, there are some fat pads that uh, can accumulate, whether in the saddlebags, as we call it, or on the inner knees lobules that form. And in stage four, it's considered lipolymphedema because at this point now, the feet are also going to be um, 
swollen where you're now retaining lymphatic fluid. Okay, so this is a picture of the stemmer sign. Uh, when you pinch with someone with lipedema, you're able to pinch the skin. With someone with lymphedema, it usually that is um, a positive sign where you cannot grasp that tissue. Uh, also, the, the pitting, the edema that is occurring, it's non-pitting in, in lipedema. Uh, you don't leave an indentation because the skin is softer. And it's usually bilateral. You could see it's going to be on both on both legs or even arms. Okay, so what are some of the characteristics? So when I, I evaluate a patient, these are some of the things that I am looking for. I'm looking for that exosymmetric fat deposit, which is usually in the hips and the legs. Um, and I, it, when I ask my patient, have they tried doing a diet? And usually fat is unaffected by caloric restriction, meaning if they do a regular diet, uh, it does not have any effect on them. Same thing when I get a lot of the younger women that exercise excessively. However, they always report, I don't know how much I can do anymore because my muscles don't come through my skin. I am not able to show the tone of the amount of work that I'm doing. Uh, their hands and feet are usually unaffected or less affected, except in the later stages. Uh, the trunk of the body is usually smaller and that's in the early stages. As it progresses, which it can, the torso, abdomen, and the arms uh, may have manifestation in the late, later stages. Now, uh, there are different uh, systems in the bodies that are involved with lipedema. So the skin is one of the systems that shows some of these manifestations. And one is painful skin sensation during rest. Just doing nothing, the skin can hurt. Um, also with activities, even more so, there will be some discomfort uh, to the patient. Um, just doing simple things around the house or walking can be painful to a lot of the, the patients that I evaluate. Uh, there is loss of skin el elasticity. What that means is even if there is a little bit of weight loss, what ends up happening, that tone of the muscle never goes back to its normal texture. Um, and they always present, not always, I, I should say most of the times my patients present with bruising, easily bruising, uh, without anything actually even touching their skin. Some of the patients will report waking up and having bruises and not knowing where they came from. Uh, tenderness to light touch uh, and the cuff sign. And as you can see in this first picture here, this is what we consider the cuff sign, uh, which is kind of like the hallmark. And also here I, I have an arrow on uh, what starting to become a lobule on the inner knee, which starts to change the whole characteristic of and the biomechanics of the knees. Also down in here, this area, it becomes a very uncomfortable, painful fat deposit. In the musculoskeletal uh, system, some of the changes that uh, I can appreciate when I evaluate the patients are the, the legs, because of their shape, they start to have an abnormal uh, gait, meaning when they're walking, it is difficult. Sometimes the legs are a little bit further apart. Now keep in mind, um, because of the changes, and the ankles and the knees, um, having flat feet is going to be another characteristic. Having laxity in their ligaments. That means that now their ligaments are not holding the joint uh, in good congruency. So they may start to have a change on how those joints appear. So you may start to become either knock knee or have more hip issues as a result. And there is that hypermobility in a lot of my patients that I see. And if um, this can be very progressive and the deterioration can occur if it's left untreated. So the best thing is to try to uh, uh, start a program for them to start managing. And then what I mean by uh, laxity is, uh, these are some of the things I would uh, test on someone. If they have increased laxity, can they palm the floor? Can they overstretch their wrist or their elbows um, at the ankles and even on their fingers? That's something that we check for, for laxity. Uh, the vascular component. So this is part of the circulation uh, system. Uh, 
the swelling that we see, uh, it's non-pitting. The swelling can be worse in the summertime. Uh, it, this fluid that builds up around the, the lipedema, sometimes it's very hard uh, to dissipate. Uh, there's also what we call acrocyanosis, and it's that bluish discoloration of the feet, um, and also sometimes the sensation of coldness in their feet and hands. Um, and then something else called vascular fragility. What that uh, demonstrates is small vessels almost uh, start to break and they start to show on the skin area, and that may leave uh, discoloration of the lower leg. Uh, and it's usually in the lower legs and even sometimes in the thigh area. Uh, here again, uh, the stages of lipedema, as I had mentioned before, and in the first stage, uh, very little bit of granular tissue in the skin is smooth, and then it starts to become a lot more granular in the thigh area. And then the fat pads and also the saddlebags begin to accumulate until we get to the fourth stage where now you see the, the swelling over the dorsum of the feet, which be, makes it very difficult for shoes and any kind of um, uh, like socks that you could wear. In addition to uh, the stages, there are types of lipedema and they get categorized according to where uh, the fat deposits are. So the anatomical location of the fat, uh, it, it gives us a better idea on how to categorize the types. So here we have from type one all the way to type type five. And this is a, um, a little bit of a different picture where the pelvis is involved. And uh, the second one is from the, the buttocks down to the knees and uh, buttocks to the ankles, meaning it's the entire lower extremity. Um, also the arms may be just involved as you see in this picture here. And then uh, just the lower leg. Some patients manifest themselves with just bigger calves and, and that's another uh, way of categorizing it. The most common lipedema type combinations, yes, it can be the arm um, and the, uh, the buttocks, all the way up to the knees. Many times this one here, but I have to say more frequently, um, I do get more of the buttocks and thigh area that I do see in our in my practice. Now, lipedema, it, we don't have a cure for it, but we definitely have management tools for it. And um, I kind of broke it down as to the different things that can be incorporated on how to treat this. And, uh, I'm going to go over some of them and then I'll have some pictures of some of the things that can be uh, used in the management. Nutrition uh, is a major one. Although that's not my forte, I am not a dietitian or a clinical nutritionist, I do take great interest in learning more about it because I have a full hour with my patient and the more we can discuss these things and understand together, um, it, it's very helpful. Compression garments, Definitely, that is a, a main tool that I think every patient should take into consideration. Pneumatic devices, uh, lymphotouch, which is a, a recent acquisition in our practice that I have been using. Uh, lymphatic, manual lymphatic drainage, which is my skill. My hands are my tools. And the manual lymphatic drainage is what I use with, with my patients to um, actually get some of the lymphatic fluid to move and uh, to bring down some of the inflammatory uh, conditions that they're uh, undergoing. Uh, there are surgical interventions such as liposuction and bariatric surgery uh, that can be used. I will touch on that uh, towards the end a little bit. Um, and another important thing is the psychosocial connection that uh, lipedema brings about. So in, in discussing some of the recommendations, uh, a lot of times my patients, uh, I will let them know to purchase or I will get it for them, uh, the Bioflex or Solideas, which are garments that have a micro massage and actually the material provides support for them. Um, they're not that easy to put on, I have to be honest with you, but the support that it provides for patient, um, it is incredible. 
I even use them. I don't have lipedema, but I just feel so good uh, when I do exercise or I walk my little dog. Um, I definitely feel the difference and, and my legs feel regenerated when I do put them on. Um, and this is the, the Lymphotouch. This is the, the newer thing that we are using at Omni Therapy uh, in areas of a lot of inflammation or discomfort, just to help minimize some of that discomfort. Also, um, I work along with a, a lymph uh, press and Flexi Touch, which these are the two types of uh, pneumatic devices that patients can have at home as a tool in their toolbox. And uh, I, again, going back to tools in the toolbox, I always want to say, I don't think I, I, I want to prepare them to have a toolbox. I want them to have a tool shed because the more uh, equipment they could put in there, uh, the, the better it is for all of the patients. Because then you're going to have options of what to do and, and how to grow from there. And compression garments are one of the, the main tools because these are, again, going back to uh, Bioflex, Solideas, they have leggings, capris, they also make shorts, tank tops, and boleros for the arms. So it all depends on, on the type of lipedema and the stage that you're on. I will make certain recommendations. I have to say my go-to are always the leggings. The more uh, compression you get, uh, the better the legs might feel. So, But in later stages, so there may be some of my patients that are in uh, stage three and four, I may have to get them into a medical grade compression where it's 20 to 30 or 30 to 40 uh, millimeters of mercury in compression. And there are times that I also have to bandage my patients if they're in that stage four where they already have a lymphatic component. Um, engage the lymphatic system. What this means is we all have a lymphatic system that can work for us. But if we can actually engage by using different things, it's definitely a plus. So dry brushing is one of them. And this is um, something that you can look up some of the uh, YouTube videos on how to perform. A lot of times I will instruct my patients uh, to bring in a brush. We can try it here. Um, uh, and I will tell them, you know, the, the type of brush that would help. It's something with soft bristles. Um, also doing self MLD and MLD stands for uh, manual lymphatic drainage. And I put here like all the pathways of how to go about it. Um, using a paint roller, this is a neat little gadget because many times if they cannot reach their feet or their ankles or their lower legs, this is a tool that it can be very helpful. Um, and these are considered um, instrument assist assisted um, soft tissue mobilization. Uh, these tools can be useful in helping to break up some of the granular tissue. I have to say though, with when using these, you can have bruises afterwards because again, remember the tissue is very fragile and it can be painful. Therapeutic tapes, different types of tapes um, to enhance the lymphatic flow. Um, these are some of the tools that I have in my practice that I incorporate on uh, the tiger tail and um, the cupping, the, just the traditional cupping, uh, the different tapes and the roller and brush. Uh, now, these are equipment that can also enhance the lymphatic flow. Um, up here I have, and these are things, some of the things that you can purchase for, for home as well, the percussion gun that has the different types of tips depending on what we want to achieve. Okay, then there is a vibration platform. This is something that you can stand on and they have smaller versions for home. Uh, you can stand and do exercises and build it up from five to 10 minutes. Some of my patients go as much as 20 to 30 minutes and it helps stimulate your lymphatic system. Now, I do have some patients that are unable to stand. Um, there's a recommendation for a vibration foot plate where you can sit and just put your feet on it and that vibration would actually help to stimulate your lymphatic. Um, mini trampoline. This is one that is used for rebounding. Rebounding has a lot of um, uh, effects on your lymphatic system to help uh, detox your body. So, and it also makes you feel good. It helps. It's not that you have to jump on it, but definitely 
uh, to get you to activate your lymphatic system. Now, activities, um, diaphragmatic breathing. Um, I try to do that with all of my patients uh, as we first start uh, performing the treatment just to get them to do some diaphragmatic breathing. The diaphragm is a muscle and it kind of like it's centered in our thorax, but as it moves up and down, it almost massages the whole lymphatic, the deep lymphatics in our body. So if a patient can use diaphragmatic breathing, one, it's very relaxing, and two, um, it really helps to activate your, your lymphatic uh, system. Aquatherapy or pool, uh, it is another great tool that can be used in order to uh, allow the patient to be able to perform exercises without the pressure of gravity. The water, the buoyancy has such wonderful effect. You could do so much more in water than you can on land. So whenever you have a chance, whether it's in the summer, some, a friend has a pool, make use of it. If you don't, if you join a gym that has a pool, make use of it as well. Uh, lymphatic yoga, uh, that is something else because it incorporates a lot of the breathing and some of the movement. It helps with the lymphatic system. If you can't do any of the other things, just walking. Walking is, is such a great exercise to help activate and keep your joints in form and also to get some of your lymphatics moving as well. So I do encourage always wearing somewhat of comfortable shoes. Um, my younger population has incorporated Pilates in, in their treatment and they have found that because in the younger population or in the earlier stages of lipedema, their trunk is not involved. So you want to engage your core muscles really well. So Pilates would be one of those uh, exercises that you want to use to engage your muscles and also to, to get some of your lymphatics to move. Maintaining the strength and um, endurance is another thing that you can achieve with this as well. And my favorite is laughter. By laughing, you're actually activating your diaphragm so that it's, again, massaging your whole internal lymphatic system. So watch a funny movie with a friend, a comedy show, whatever makes you laugh, do it. And that one, that's a freebie. Anybody can do that one. Um, so lifestyle changes recommendations uh, for, for the lipedema population uh, the, the one thing I try to encourage everybody, it's the proper sleep, getting proper sleep. When your body rests, it downloads all the daily activity and it allows your body to reset and heal. So if you get proper sleep, it is so important in managing any disease. And even like if you do have lymphedema or any other of the inflammatory conditions that you may be plagued with. Um, the My other lifestyle changes that I, I try to talk to a lot of my patients about, it's nutrition that feeds you and heals you. Find out what are some of the, the things that make the lipedema become more inflamed. Jot it down, keep a log, do a journal of your food and how you feel. When you do that, you're able to map out what you want to keep out of your system and what you want to include in your system. Uh, an anti-inflammatory way of eating is very important because that uh, helps prevent the buildup of cytokines and the lipedema fat that is around the tissue, which will make it even more painful. Um, now, I had mentioned before that there are some treatments, uh, uh, surgical treatments, which is considered a liposuction, but it's not just any liposuction. It is a special type of liposuction, which is uh, considered um, water-assisted liposuction so that there is minimal damage to the lymphatic system. Um, and so I have had patients that have had the liposuction and then they end up coming back for uh, the management of that and, you know, getting properly fitted for their garments. I always say that um, if you are going to consider liposuction, because not everybody's a candidate for it, and also keep in mind, insurance companies are not always out there to 
um, reimbursed for, for these procedures, which I hope in the future that changes because uh, it needs to be. This is a medical condition. And if this is a treatment, it should be something that should be covered. So I always tell my, my patients that are considering liposuction, try everything first. And what I mean by that is like all these tools in your toolbox or your tool shed, try them. If they work, wonderful, keep using them. If it's giving you improvement, um, definitely incorporate them. I also tell my patients, do your research when you're considering uh, liposuction. And just when you think you've done enough research, do some more research. Don't just um, assume that because someone said I had the surgery and they had a great turnout that that's going to be your case. Every patient is an individual and um, every surgery is unique to that person. Uh, so I always encourage join a group for support and more information. There are many groups out there that are providing information about the liposuction, how to go about it, uh, who to talk to. And I do have quite a few patients that have gone to multiple uh, evaluations just to see if that surgeon is one that's going to be the right one for them. Now, uh, many times if there is a combination of uh, lipedema and obesity, some of the doctors may suggest um, bariatric surgery uh, instead of doing the liposuction. Uh, that's another thing that you also have to do your, your thorough research on. Now, th this is a main component of lipedema and the fact that the medical community knows so little about lipedema, um, it creates a lot of psychosocial complications with this patient population. And the more doctors they see, the more discouraged they get, because many times they are just told that you are obese and you just need to go and lose weight as if it was that simple. So what this does to someone who they already probably try multiple things and nothing has worked, then they start to look at themselves and then they would have appearance related distress, which it, it, it plays in their mind uh, day and night, leading them into state of depression many times. And this will give them a poor quality of life. Um, many patients sometimes uh, retract themselves into isolation. And if you're not going out and you're not doing normal things, then you start to have complications with your own body. There may be uh, orthopedic complications uh, to the knees, to the back, hips, ankles. Many times uh, my uh, lipedema patients end up having total knee replacement because of how their body is changing and the dynamics and biomechanics of their body is changing. So this now just uh, kind of manifests itself in a whole different aspect. And um, many times, you know, not wanting to go out because you can't find the proper clothing. And I know I talk about swimming. Oh, where do I find a swimsuit that would fit me? Look, they are out there and they, they have these groups that are supporting and providing. And if you're able to get it into a pool that will help, then do that. But I understand the difficulty of shoes and the clothing. For patients, just uh, you know, think about this. If your torso is a size four, but yet your lower extremities are a size 12, trying to put yourself into a dress of that nature, that's gonna be a bit uncomfortable. And then you end up having to have your clothes altered. So there's many things that um, present as a psychosocial complication uh, with this patient population. Um, so I have like some ideas of what I like to tell my patients to do is join patient groups. I tried, well, before pandemic, uh, we would have groups of support groups of the women with lipedema. And I never, I would put a time that it would start, but never would finish because we would be here for hours because once they connected, it was so nice for them to talk to each other. So joining patient groups is it's a wonderful thing. And, and I have this, um, I call it the four C's 
of living life to the fullest. Uh, one is considering counseling of if you're having difficulty with coping. So coping strategies is one of the C's. Connecting with professionals that can help. And in life, just connecting with anybody that can help, it's a plus. Contribute. And I don't mean monetarily to contribute. I'm talking about contribute information and spread the word about what you are going through and uh, your disease process. And um, also my other, this is my big C, which I love to do is to cook. Cook your meals to avoid ultra processed foods because that a lot of times uh, can destroy and can make your lipedema worse. And it just keeps you on that pain cycle. So cooking your food, uh, it, it's fun. It's, for me, it's, it's my hobby. So I love it. And then and the other one is love yourself. Um, there is a lot of things to be stressed about, but love yourself because the more love you give to yourself, uh, the better the place you would be in and the more that not only you help yourself in this, but help others and help other understand. There are some organizations that um, actually produce a lot of this information that I presented to you today. Get involved with them. Um, the Fat Disorder Resource Society, uh, they have a lot of information out there. Uh, just like the Lipedema Foundation, they want to know about what you're going through. They like to uh, get a whole history of patients. So try to find these on on the internet. Um, there's a lot of social media that is working along with lipedema patients. Uh, also, the, the registry itself, they want to know because if they're doing research, they want to know where are these patients, who are they, and what are they going through. And uh, many of the Facebook groups that are out there uh, are very helpful, whether you're considering having surgery or you just want to know how to deal with daily life as a, a lipedema patient. So these are some of the resources that uh, you may find. Uh, another thing is get involved with the Lymphedema Treatment Act. Um, as you probably know, well, here in the States, for instance, we, we have a lot of uh, red tape in trying to get things covered for our patients. Um, so the Lymphedema Treatment Act is one way to get involved to uh, make our government aware of this so that uh, more more money can be invested and uh, and bring in awareness of this disease process. And, and luckily, I, last year, we, um, we had the development of the standard of practice for, for lipedema under Dr. Karen Herbs. Um, so that has been a great piece of information that has provided so much more uh, structure to how to go about treating someone with lipedema. So there's always information out there, but I have a good feeling that in the future, we will see a lot more research coming out and hopefully a lot more involvement uh, from the medical community, which knows so little about um, lipedema itself, never mind lymphedema. Lipedema is even more, um, there's a desert out there about that information. I have a reference list here, and I just want to say thank you, and please spread the knowledge. All right, Dr. Jenny. I can't hear you. <laughs> I'm still on mute. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I said that the cat was so cute. Not saying thank you like that. Yes, You're yes, welcome. I totally agree with that. We're learning more and more about lipidema. Lymphedema is now more, um, we're more aware of that, especially some clients getting more understanding, but the doctor itself and some of the clients are not aware of the difference of the lipidema and the lymphedema. So this is really wonderful for us to know more about the difference, you know, and you itemize it exactly on the column, the different, um, exactly on those differences. 
So if you have any questions, um, we can always, you are on the panelists, guys, we can still have like at least five, 10 minutes if you have any question. Um, Abby is here, so at least we can um, entertain some questions if you have, guys. And you have an opportunity to unmute yourselves and raise your hand if you are on the attendees. So that will be very, very helpful. Thank you, Oscar. Great, great presentation. The co-founder of Home Therapy. Yes, yes. All right. So we have the QA chat room and there's an individual chat room. So let me know if you have any questions so far. So while waiting, I don't see any in the QA. Um, Anna, what will be your biggest challenges right now in your practice that you um you remember really the challenge in your day to day as a lymphedema therapist? Um, I have to say that the biggest challenge is um, making the patients understand that uh, although they have seen many doctors, so many times they have been misdiagnosed. Now they're coming to me and they were most likely sent and told that they had lymphedema. And now I have to kind of undo all that information and present all this. And for them, it's challenging sometimes hearing that this is what their body is presenting. And I tell you, many times there's boxes of tissues in my room that we go through because I have to explain to them that this is not their fault. It's not their doing that uh, they are the way they are. It's not because they're sitting home and eating. It's because they have been dealt with this genetic component, hormonal component, and their body has changed. And also their understanding, you know, um, major does your majority of clients are they're all compliant? Um, I want to say most of them are, but there are a few that, and it's not because they don't want to be. A lot of times it's limitations. Now keep in mind when your legs are so big or uh, your body has changed its shape in order to put on those garments and to do all those things. It takes a lot of doing. Many times I end up helping them with their garments. And, uh, and for me, it's easy. And, you know, I don't want to make it look like, yes, it is easy. And then they go home and try it and they're challenged. So for the most part, I think the toughest part of the treatment is the uh, nutrition part because that's not my forte. And we really don't have anybody that is working along with uh, the lines of what is necessary for a lipedema patient. I mean, I know very basic stuff and I know some, some patients do um, keto and others do anti-inflammatory, paleo, and they all have somewhat of a success for a while, but then all of a sudden it can plateau. So, you know, that's a challenging thing as well too that's true and then also thank you for emphasizing that lymphedema therapy act because a part of the proceeds will be going to the lymphedema therapy act last november we have dr saeed um, who presented in our lymphedema workshop and he explained to us how does the lymphedema therapy act supported the lymphedema at ad their advocacies and also the president header so thank you so much do you have any question guys so far all right so i don't have on the chat room and any closing remarks um anna um, for everybody that's listening, I hope this was uh, educational for my colleagues, the therapists, in understanding the difference. Uh, just because the prescription says it's lymphedema, look at it with different set of eyes. Um, don't just take that for word because, like I said, the medical community, it's lear they're learning more about this. Don't give up on them. But it's our job also to educate the, the professionals, the doctors. And uh, the one that I really want to get to, it's more like the, the pediatrics. They're seeing these teenagers undergo changes in their bodies. And a lot of times they'll say, well, mom is a big lady. So um, maybe the daughter just looks like her. I think they need to have some awareness that this can start at puberty. And these are 
um, pediatricians that are looking at these clients. So that could be a great start for us to promote uh, the pediatric world to recognize lipedema earlier on so that we don't get to the point of treating adults with the severe uh, stages that they come in to see us. And for my uh, lymphedema patients and lipedema patients, uh, thank you all for everything you do to keep me motivated to learn more. Thank you, guys. Yes, yes. And also, um, sorry, um, Anna, I just saw a message and a question from Eunice. If a patient has arterial wound, do we have to request ABI test first before doing compression? Um, well, yes, if they do have wounds, and that's more of a lymphatic, not necessarily lipedema, but yes, you would want to get an ABI if there are wounds. You want to make sure that it's not arterial in nature versus um, a venous wound. All right, okay. And Nadia is saying a very excellent presentation, nicely and easy to understand the presentation. And you are a great therapist. You're welcome, Eunice. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Anna. All right. Thank you, guys. So that's our questions there. All right. So thank you so much. And let's go next. Uh, let me share my screen. Thanks, Anna. Okay. Here is. Okay. That's awesome. And I like all those different. Um, the things that I saw, lots of stuff that I don't know. <laughs> you know, I know trampoline, but there's a mini trampoline. I like the one that massage your body. And I'm sure they like that. And the foot stepper, vibrator. And all right, thank you so much, Anna, for giving us a nice um, different devices there. All right. <music>